everyone. Thank you for joining us today for today's conservation conversation. We're taking a look behind the lens with our guest, Brandon Gwill today. I'll go ahead and get started with his introduction. So who is Brandon? Brandon is a first-generation Costa Rican American, a six-year PhD candidate at Boston University, and a National Science Foundation pre-doctoral fellow. He currently researches the reproductive and behavioral ecology of gliding tree frogs. Brandon uses photography to communicate science, inspire a passion for wildlife, and create advocates for conservation. Brandon is an avid outdoorsman, a plant and snake dad, and a home chef and baker. So as a wildlife photographer, Brandon's photograph of gliding tree frogs was highly commended in the behavior amphibians and reptiles category of this year's wildlife photographer of the year exhibition. So thank you, Brandon, for joining us today. We welcome you in conversation as you share your passion for wildlife conservation and talk about your experience researching gliding tree frogs. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for that introduction, Nadia. Um, I'm super excited to be here today. And I have a couple slides prepared. So I'm going to go ahead and just get that set up for us. OK, awesome. So um, as Nadia said, I am Brandon Guell. I am a student at Boston University, a PhD student. And for the uh, past six years, I've been studying gliding tree frogs, which are these little frogs uh, in my background photo here. And um, I'm really excited to tell you a little bit about what I do as a PhD student, and specifically, um, just briefly mention how I use photography in my research to, to study them. Okay, so go ahead and get Okay, and I want to begin um, by telling you how things started for me. So I grew up obsessed with wildlife and being outside and surrounded by animals. And so by the time I was 10, I already knew that when I grew up, I wanted to be a scientist. And I remember writing in this homework report that, you know, I wanted to be a nature scientist, quote unquote, um, even though I didn't know what that meant. And I wanted to work with animals. And so um, I think this had a lot to do with um, traveling throughout Costa Rica, where my family's from when I was a kid but also from watching and looking up to people like Steve Irwin, um, who was a crocodile hunter, right? This very famous and enthusiastic wildlife presenter from Australia, and he was a conservationist as well. And so, you know, after many years of studying and working really hard um, and preparing for some good luck, I've found myself doing just that, working with animals, um, being a quote unquote nature scientist in the form of being a PhD student and, you know, wildlife biologist working with these gliding tree frogs in Central America. And so that's what I wanna tell you a little bit about today. And I wanna start by virtually taking you to the field with me. So to Costa Rica's Osa Peninsula, where after a night of really heavy rain, thousands of these gliding tree frogs have aggregated or come together on this really large tree over a pond. And so if you, you, know, if you look closely at this video, you'll see the leaves and the branches of these videos are just covered with these green frogs with orange legs and orange feet. And those are the gliding tree frogs. And the reason that they're all here at the same place and at the same time is because they're here to breed, to reproduce. And one of the things that makes these frogs really interesting is the way that they do this all at the same time, all at the same place. Because unlike most frogs that breed in pairs individually and lay eggs in water, these frogs breed you know, by the thousands and they lay their eggs on these leaves. Um, and you know, the result of this is that females can lay hundreds of thousands to probably millions of eggs in just a couple of hours. So it's really impressive. But despite you know, having this really spectacular way of breeding and reproducing, because these events occur in these really remote places where I work, um, in the middle of the jungle, um, and they're hard to predict and they're quite rare, we know very little about them. And so I wanna show you just really quickly a couple of ways that I've used photography in my research to study the biology of these frogs. And the first way I've done this is just by filming their breeding behavior, just filming their interactions and trying to understand them. So what you're looking at here is a video of a bunch of males that are scrambling all over one particular female, which is that slightly larger frog in the middle of this group. And she's the one that's dangling from the branch um, by just a couple of her legs here. She's the one dangling there. And the reason that all of these males are surrounding her and fighting over her and fighting each other over her is because they're trying to um, 
take the place of the male that's mated with her, so the one that's on her back, and they want to be able to breed with her when she's ready to lay eggs. Um, and I've used photography to study other behaviors that are really interesting and that we don't know much about. And so I want to tell you really quickly about a couple of them. And the first one that I want to tell you about, um, I call vent positioning. So this is when a single male comes over to a female that's already mated with a male and she's laying eggs and he scooches up next to them. Um, and, you know, it's very likely that he's trying to uh, breed with her, even though he's not in the mating position with her. The other behavior that um, I've studied is called egg kicking. And this is a really interesting behavior because a male that's by himself, a single male, will position himself over these uh, recently laid eggs and he'll kick at them and he'll do this for several minutes. But he does this even when the female isn't there um, and even when the, the mated pair isn't there. And so I've used photography to describe these behaviors and to study how common they are and also to see if they're associated with these males actually being able to reproduce or father any one of these eggs. So some of my research has focused on studying breeding behavior, and I've used photography and videography um, in a lot of different ways. But I've also used photography to study the development of these eggs, the hundreds of thousands of these eggs that I mentioned. And I can do this because gliding tree frog eggs um, are clear and transparent, so you can actually see through the egg and watch the embryos develop over time just with your naked eye, which is really cool. But I use photography to study development as well. And I do this using really powerful macro lenses that are basically like as powerful as microscopes. And they allow us to take pictures of eggs over time to, um, and it enlarges them to five times their, their actual life size. And so what this allows us to see are things like the initial cell division um, of the cells. So this is what you're looking at here. Um, we can look at the subsequent, you know, four and eight cell stages as they continue to develop and eventually uh, the multicellular stages. And if you look really closely here, you see like little black dots within each one of these tiny cells in the top of the egg. Those are the individual nuclei that we can see um, during development. And eventually, you know, after just a couple of days, um, the embryos will become distinct and the bodies will form on top of their really large yolk sacs. So they retain this yolk, which has all of their energy that they're using to, to develop and grow within their eggs. And at this stage, they develop the ability to move. So we can take videos of them, you know, like squirming inside of their egg and see, you know, how these different parts of their bodies are starting to develop. You can see um, their external gills are these like weird little knobs that are coming out of their necks. Um, that big round thing is their heart that's developing. Um, and you can see their big bulbous eyes that are starting to develop too. And just a few days later, or just a few hours later, really, they'll start to develop more pigmentation, so more color, the eyes will become distinct, um, and they'll develop all these other physiological structures and sensory uh, organs that are really important. And one of the structures is the heart, of course, that develops. And so we can take videos. Um, I don't know if it's still playing there. Yeah. There we go. And we can take videos and you can visualize the heart beating. Um, and these eggs are really small. You have to remember they're about the size of, you know, like a pea, maybe about four to five millimeters. So very, very small. I mean, we can see the blood pumping through their veins and through their large external gills even. And we can continue to do this in the lab um, up until these eggs hatch, which is around six days after they were laid. But one of the other things that makes gliding tree frogs really interesting is that they can hatch early. So they can prematurely hatch um, about 30 to 50% premature. And they do this in response to different egg threats, like if the eggs become flooded or if predators come and start attacking them because they want to eat them. And so we can take advantage of this and use photography in a different context to study things like embryo behavior and the hatching process. So this is a three-day-old embryo that we've flooded underwater. And we can use this video to learn things about, uh, to learn things like how long it takes for them to rupture a little hole in their membrane so that you can see its face starting to squeeze out of this tiny little hole that it's created. Um, we can see if there's compression evidence. So this is just um, indicating how big the hole is to their uh, relative to their body size. You saw them thrashing and swimming. So how much effort they have to put in to try and squeeze through this tiny hole. Um, and so we can, you know, visualize these things and, and study them. And eventually we can record how long it takes for them to hatch, right? Um, and we can see how this hatching ability changes with development by testing embryos at different ages. And basically, we can determine if they get better or worse or faster or slower at these things. 
I've also used photography to study embryo behavior and hatching in this other context, which is predation. And so this is a video of a cat-eyed snake preying on a four-day-old um, gliding tree frog clutch. And we took this using an infrared camera because these are nocturnal snakes. So they come out at night and eat on these, uh, prey on these eggs at night. And if you look really closely, you'll see a couple embryos hatch and they'll pop out of the frame of this video. So there went one. And there's a couple other ones that are hatching out of their eggs to escape being eaten. Um, and you'll see, you know, most of these, most of these eggs will be eaten, but a few of them will hatch. And so we can use videos like this to study things like the escape rates of um, this species at different developmental ages, basically how many of the eggs um, can escape during this predator attack. And we can do this again um, at different developmental stages or different ages of the eggs and see if that gets better or worse or higher or lower. Okay, so I just want to um, quickly also mention how I think photography is such a useful tool for conservation. And I think this is the case whether, you know, we're using it to describe new species or collect data on these really vulnerable populations or vulnerable species, um, or whether it's to show the direct impact of climate change on um, amphibian survival. And so I've done that in the past, um, where I have studied gliding tree frog eggs and basically how they dry up and die if there's not enough rain or humidity, which is um, because of climate change. Um, and there, it's also a really useful tool just to show and educate people about you know, the diverse species that exist and the really cool places that they live. And I think together, no matter how we use photography, um, it can be this really powerful tool to connect people to wildlife and wild places. And I think it encourages us and helps us appreciate and care about these species uh, and protecting them and their habitats. And I just want to quickly mention why I think that matters, especially for amphibians. And it's because um, about one third of the world's amphibians are threatened in some capacity, and hundreds of species have gone extinct just in my lifetime. And so what this plot, what this graph, uh, this map is showing here is the number of species per, ge per geographic area that are either critically endangered um, or endangered and vulnerable. And so if you look at Central America, where I work, um, this is Costa Rica, this little section of Central America here, there's over a thousand species that are either critically endangered or endangered and vulnerable. And if you look at South America, where we have the highest number of amphibian species in the world, um, there's over 2,000 species that are endangered to some capacity. And so, you know, there are many reasons why amphibians are in decline. Habitat destruction is a very um, big cause of this, right? So these are things like deforestation. Um, climate change is, of course, a very large um, factor. But there's also something that you might not be familiar with, which is uh, this frog pandemic that has been killing many, many species and affecting a lot of vulnerable populations for decades. Um, it's not just been a couple of years, it's been decades uh, that this frog pandemic has been um, affecting different species. And so what can you do um, and what can we do? Well, I would say the, the most impact you can probably have is by becoming a conservationist yourself or a scientist or a wildlife biologist or some something like that. Um, and I think the main thing that you're gonna be doing in that capacity and that you can do, even if you don't pursue those things is to just educate yourself and to educate others, right? Spread awareness. And um, lastly, one thing that, you know, I think we can all do um, and also enjoy or support things like the Disneyland for Toads, quote unquote, which is um, a, a nice name for the National Amphibian Conservation Center um, here at the Detroit Zoo. And there's plenty of other places that you can support that are um, making lots of efforts to try and conserve um, vulnerable populations of, of amphibians. And so I just want to end um, by saying that I feel super lucky to be able to do this as my job. Um, even when my boots are full of, you know, gross, disgusting pond water and there's mosquitoes everywhere. Um, I really love it. I love working with animals. I love being able to play in the jungle. And so I just want to leave you with a few pieces of advice in case you also, you know, might be thinking about becoming a wildlife biologist or conservationist, or maybe you want to get into wildlife photography, anything that really is related to anything that I've ever done. And so the first thing is um, that I think knowledge is power. <laughs> and um, what I mean by this is that there's no replacement for studying and working really hard. It's going to give you the tools to be able to pursue whatever you want to do in life, whether it's related to these things or not. The second is not to be afraid to ask questions. So this is the best piece of advice I ever got when I went into grad school to start my PhD. And it's because you're never going to know everything. I definitely don't know everything and no one is going to know everything. But by sharing this knowledge with each other, we're going to um, prepare ourselves again for more success. 
Um, the next thing is to be prepared for good luck. And this, what I mean by this is just to um, be prepared to take advantage of opportunities that present themselves because you're not always going to be expecting um, doors to open. And if you're ready to take advantage of them, you're going to be able to, um, you know, uh, be more successful in, in that sense. And so lastly, just, you know, I, I encourage you to find what you're passionate about. You know, I, I love being outside. I love working with animals. Um, and so I've pursued this PhD um, and studying these frogs in that capacity. And so I encourage you to do the same. And so I just want to, you know, end by saying, I appreciate you listening to me and telling you a little bit about my work. Um, and I'd be super happy to chat with any one of you if you ever want to reach out. Here's my contact information if you want to learn about what it's like being a PhD student in general or my specific work or my photography, anything like that. I'd be more than happy to um, chat about those types of things. Thanks so much. Thank you, Brandon. That is super fascinating. The footage of the eggs is kind of incredible, considering how tiny they are. That's really amazing. Yeah, so we do have some questions for you if you're prepared. Awesome. I know that Definitely. you just talked a lot, but we've got a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. Would you mind walking us through your journey of photography? How did that interest start? Yeah, that's a great question. So I actually started um, I was introduced to photography with videos of um, embryos hatching, like the one that I showed you. That was the first time I ever saw, you know, a very fancy camera, um, and I knew nothing about how to use them. Um, and so I was really introduced to photography as a tool to, to apply to, you know, videotape animal behavior and to use it as a tool for research. And since then, I just kind of became obsessed with it. Um, I thought it was so interesting and so cool the way we could, you know, take pictures and videos of these things, kind of like microscopes, but in a way that was more accessible, right? Because di the digital age of photography makes it so easy to share things online or to like rewatch things and um, capture tons of tons of moments. And so I've just kind of slowly developed this um, appreciation and passion for it. Um, but it did start from using it as this tool and, and, um, my advisor, so my PhD supervisor, is the one that really introduced me into photography. And um, eventually, she sold me one of her old cameras, and that was like my first camera ever. And so, um, ever since then, I've just kind of been slowly, um, you know, getting more gear and practicing every time that I'm in the field, and um, even taking pictures of bugs and birds, like in my backyard and things like that, just for fun. So, yeah, that's that's how I that's how I started. <laughs> It's a really cool intersection of art and science. I love that. Um, our next question is, why did you decide to research gliding frogs or gliding tree frogs specifically? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I've always liked frogs. Um, I've always loved snakes. <laughs> Um, but studying snakes is, is really difficult, I think, because snakes are really elusive, which means that they're really hard to find. They're hard to study. Um, they're usually you know, they're usually hiding and things like that. Frogs are much easier to study. Um, and the lab that I chose to do my PhD in was already studying um, the red-eyed tree frog, which is a close, close, a close relative. It's it's kind of like a cousin to the gliding tree frogs. And so we, you know, there was a lot of foundational work um, in my lab for embryo behavior and a little bit of reproductive behavior and things like that. Um, but my initial exposure to it was actually through what's called an REU. So this is called, this is um, a research opportunity, REU, what is it? Research, I can't remember what it's called, but it's a research opportunity for undergrads. Um, so in my undergrad, when I was in, in college at university, I applied to this scholarship basically, and it allowed me to go to Panama um, to the middle of the jungle and work with my current advisor who mentored me and um, gave me a lot of insight into what it's like to work in the tropics, what it's like to work with frogs. Um, I had no experience, no idea what I was doing, but um, I think, you know, applying to positions like that where there's very good mentorship uh, uh, roles that that allow you to grow and develop skills was was really like what got me to where I am today. Awesome, thank you. Um, so you mentioned that you love being outdoors. I did also hear you talk about mosquitoes. <laughs> what is a typical day like in the field? Yeah, that's a that's a good question too. So um, I have, let's see. So actually, in this slide, 
that's still on the screen. I think it's still shared. Um, this is very similar to what a typical day in the field is, at least when there's a lot of work to do. Um, I'll wake up like at four in the morning <laughs> and go to the this large pond, which is where these gliding tree frogs breed. And I'll first of all, I'll just check to see if they've arrived because um, they breed very infrequently. So they don't breed every day. They don't breed every week or every month. It's only a few times of year after really, really heavy rain, uh, after rainstorms. And so when they're there, I'll, I'll get into the pond. And depending on how full it is at that time, I'll either be, you know, waist deep, like in the first photo or almost chest deep, like in the second photo. <clears throat> and yeah, I'll do everything from photography to um, collecting eggs so that we can study the development and the behavior of the embryos later. Um, to collecting adults and um, collecting snakes to use as predators. So it's a lot of like animal collection in the field, which is really fun. And then there's a lot of lab work that goes into it. And so I have, I'll have like a little um, area at a research station where I can set up these experiments, like the snake predation experiments, or set up the camera to, to videotape um, the embryos hatching and things like that. A lot of egg care. So I think, you know, being a good pet parent is is a good trait that has helped me um, in this work because you have to take care of the eggs, make sure you know uh, they're they're being watered properly every day. You need to basically um, mist them down with rainwater <laughs> to make sure that they they stay nice and hydrated so they don't dry out if you collect them and then you're using them for experiments. Um, when they all hatch, you have to take the tadpoles back. You have to collect rainwater in the jungle when it rains, and um, we just do that with buckets. So it's a lot of um, a lot of different things that go into maintaining animals um, alive, collecting them in the field, studying them, recording them, um, prepping experiments. And then, of course, comes all the second half of, of research, which is looking at the data and analyzing data. So this is working like in Excel sheets um, with the data you collect, beginning to analyze them, making figures, starting to write um, articles about our findings and, and trying to publish those making presentations and giving them um, at meetings, things like that. So there's, yeah, it's 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 fun. And I really enjoyed it because I think um, it's something that you never get bored doing. There's always something different to do, especially when you have field work and then you have, um, you know, like the writing process and presentation process too. Nice that there's some diversity there. You're out in the field and then you do your lab work and then you get to work on Excel. <laughs> yep, yep. Oh yeah, and, and I didn't mention that, um, for my work, I usually go to the field for about three to four months. So I'll actually be living at this remote field site. Um, and there is internet and there is, you know, electricity and things like that, but it's it's all somewhat primitive and remote. It's all based off like solar, uh, solar powered um, energy and generators and things like that. So if there's no sun for a couple of days and it's raining really hard, there'll be no electricity. Um, you know, there's no town to go to if you need to get supplies it's it's um that's a big long trip and stuff so um the field work can be really intense and I, that's something that I really love about it because I feel like I'm very much immersed in the in the jungle <laughs> speaking of your field research we have a good question um what dangers do you encounter or anticipate during your outdoor research and how do you deal with that yeah that's a good question too um so when you do field work there's always there's always things you need to be very careful about. Um, in my case, um, you know, access to to medical treatment is is uh, something to think about. So I'm not near any large towns. Like it would take several hours to get to a hospital if there was an accident or anything happened. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of like you know potential dangerous things um, in the jungle. Um, one of them being, you know, venomous snakes, which are pretty much everywhere. <laughs> um, so just being really conscious about that, making sure you, you know, know what snakes are, are venomous, which ones aren't, um, never handling them for really any reason at all. Um, in the pond, there are also caimans. Um, so these are like small crocodilians that get about like four to five feet, maybe, but they're actually more interested in the frogs than they are in people, which is great. And so you know, I've had run-ins with them before, but it's nothing, nothing dangerous. Um, I think the most dangerous thing is probably exhaustion or dehydration, um, or you know, getting a ton of like mosquito bites and things like that. <laughs> um, 
yeah, so just making sure you're taking care of yourself in the field is, is really important and giving yourself breaks because some of this field work can be really uh, exhausting and, and it takes endurance, right? I don't wake up and work nine to five and then call it a day. If, if the frogs are there and there's work to do, I'm going to work until there's no more frogs and there's no more work. Um, but then, you know, of course, later there's days where I can take, you know, more time off and things like that. So yeah, balancing, balancing your time is important too, to make sure you don't get exhausted. Sounds really intense. <laughs> so another question, can you go into more detail about catching snakes for prey? Yeah, definitely. So um, we use these little cat-eyed snakes, like in the video that you saw, um, and they are the most abundant um, predator of eggs at these field sites naturally, right? So they'll, if you go out at night, um, which I do often, and you just look around in the trees, there'll be anywhere from, you know, five to 20 different snakes that are just all over the trees eating all of these eggs because there's eggs everywhere. Um, the nice thing is that they're not venomous <laughs> and that they're also very small. So they're, if anyone is familiar with like what, what corn snake is like, that's about the same size. So they're, they're really, really thin. Um, they're not very thick and they're you know, not very long either, maybe, I don't know, maybe anywhere from two to three feet long. Um, and catching them is surprisingly easy because um, even when they put up a little fight, like because I said they're so small, um, you know, there's no danger, There's they're not gonna bite you and they're not gonna escape. Um, and so we do this very gently, either by hand or using snake hooks just to like gently pick them off um, of the vegetation. And we'll put them like in in bags. Um, a lot of times, people that work with snakes use pillowcases <laughs> because it's a very breathable material, and you can just toss them in the pillowcase and then um, you know put them in the enclosure. And so, of course, that's something else that I do is make sure that every animal that I'm working with has a very um, you know like a very nice enclosure um, to to live in when I'm not using them for for these experiments. Um, but yeah, I I love it. It's very fun. Um, that's some of the night work that I'll do because they're nocturnal. So um, you can only really find them at night being active and, and collecting them and setting them up for experiments is, is really fun as well. Um, I've never had any issues with them. They're, they're really gentle and really sweet. Um, and yeah, like I said, I love snakes. So I think it's, it's really fun to be able to use snakes in, in my research um, as predators. Yeah, both of your interests in one, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so we are a little low on time, so I'm going to ask one final question, which is, what's your favorite part about your job? Oh my gosh, um, there are so many things, right? Um, but I would have to say that the field work is is my favorite. I love being, you know, in the field. I love being able to and and working with animals. I love to be able to get my hands dirty, you know, get waist deep and chest deep in the pond if I have to. Um, and I think. One thing that uh, many people that do this type of field research would agree on is that one of the best things is being able to work in these really cool remote places that, you know, maybe not a lot of people are going to be able to visit or see um, otherwise. And so that's a huge, huge benefit, which, you know, I absolutely love. Um, but yeah, definitely working with animals and being in the field. I just, I can't get enough of it. <laughs> How awesome that you get to research animals. See, I'm going to share my screen one last time as we wrap up. Brandon, we want to thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Um, if anyone is interested in connecting with Brandon, you can go to his website at brandonguill.com. You can also find him on many social media channels from Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, even YouTube. Um, thank you for your remarkable dedication to animal conservation. Again, thank you for being here. Thank you for participating in this conservation conversation. Thank you so much for having me. It's, yeah, super great to be here. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Bye.